Uh oh. What have I gotten myself into here? Well, as you can see, I seem to have embarked on a bit of a project here. Uh, this is a scale modeling project. Let me bring the box out and I'll show you what we've got. This is the Star Trek USS Enterprise NCC 1701 refit. Uh, the scale is 1350. It's a very large model. When complete, it's nearly three feet long. I believe the saucer section is about 18 inches wide. Uh, so this is a pretty substantial model. I have not done a model in about 25 years. The last model that I did was the Cuddy Sark, which I believe was a Revel model. Uh, and that was quite some time ago. I was in my very early 20s when I began doing that. Um, I was by no means a professional at it. I was very amateur. I think I had a very small selection of paints. I had uh, testers glue and I think even just testers enamel at the time. Like I, I didn't use an airbrush on it. It was all brushing um, by hand. The results were not great, obviously. Uh, but I mean, I put a lot of time into that model and uh, I did enjoy it. My, I was, I was about 90% of the way through that model and uh, I was just doing the final rigging. Um, and unfortunately, while I was at work one day, I had it on top of my fridge, which is somewhere my cat went and she knocked it off the fridge, which was a long way to fall. And I got home from work that day and the model was busted open. Like it was, it was keeled over on its side. The hull was actually split open, not at the seam. Um, it had cracked the actual plastic. Uh, two of the masts were broken. The rigging was all tangled and some of it had obviously snapped loose. You know, and I studied it for a couple of hours trying to decide whether it was salvageable. And in the end, I, I decided it wasn't. I, it may have been, maybe if I had uh, just cut all the rigging off of it. Uh, and reset all the broken plastic, perhaps, perhaps, but it would have been quite the job and I just wasn't willing to take it on, even with all the hours I had put into it. So in the end, I um, it ended up in the dumpster, unfortunately. It was quite a heartbreaker. So that was 25 years ago. I haven't done a model since then. I have wanted to. Uh, I did attempt to once. I bought a, a figurine um, and I did buy some paints for it. I'll show you very quickly here when I start getting into the inventory that I've accumulated. Um, but in the end, I just wasn't too interested. It was a resin model that I'd ordered from, I believe, Japan or something like that. Uh, it was nice. It was very well done, but I just wasn't as into it as I would be something like the Cuddy Sork or, or this here. I am a Star Trek fan. Um, I did, as a kid, watch the original series. Of course, it was in syndication basically from the day it was canceled. Uh, so I did watch the original series. I, I could never have told you the order that the Enterprise, or sorry, that the Star Trek, the original series episodes came in. I couldn't ever probably sit down and describe any of the episodes. Um, the first real Star Trek that I remember seriously getting into would have been The Next Generation. Uh, when that came out, I would have been a teenager, and uh, that, I mean, it, is, it wowed me, and I was a real big fan of that show. As far as the motion pictures, uh, the actual, the first of the motion pictures, the motion picture, was not the first Star Trek feature film that I saw. The first that I saw was The Wrath of Khan, and I still remember the effect that it had on me when I saw the refit Enterprise. I didn't know that's what it was at the time. But I remember when they first toured the outside of that ship uh, in their little shuttlecraft, and I was just blown away, and I thought, wow, that is such a beautiful ship. And then more recently on YouTube, I've seen guys doing uh, build builds of this, or just basically showing off the builds that they had done, and I was immediately entranced, and I decided this is something I need to do. In fact, uh, I announced to the guys at work, I, I showed them the video, and I said, this is something I want. <laughs> A couple of days later, uh, I, I showed them a picture of some of the inventory I'd already accumulated, including this box. And I said, this is something I'm going to have. And everybody kind of laughed. But So yeah, I'm committed to this project. This is something that's going to happen. Uh, full disclosure, I have begun 
already, but not much. I've begun the uh, bridge assembly. I didn't begin video recording right from the beginning of the build, but I started taking some pictures just for reference for myself. And then uh, after maybe a day or two, I started recording some video. And I thought, you know what, maybe I can do a build series as well. Now there is a full build series in a channel called Trekworks. Uh, he is an experienced, very professional modeler, and he did a bang up job both in his video presentations, in his explanation of his build process, and of course in his final product. Simply amazing. That is a bar that I don't expect to even come close to touching. But I'm going to give it my best shot, and I thought I would uh, maybe document this along the way. So this is my introduction. Um, yeah, I'm pretty excited about going through this process. I've given myself six months to do this. I'm, I'm not expecting to, to do this any anytime soon. I'm not going to rush through this. I'm going to take my time. In fact, it's been, so today is November 2nd. It's been, it's a Friday, it's been exactly two weeks since I bought this uh, project and the initial supplies. Since then, I've kind of gone through the instructions um, and a lot of the build process that Trekworks did uh, and others. There are some blogs, some odd, like website blogs online where guys have gone through the build process as well. And I've, you know, I, I, nothing but respect for these guys because this is quite the project. If, if they're looking to achieve a, a realistic final assembly, um, it, it, it's, it takes some dedication, it takes some patience, it takes some skills some creativity, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to exercising these skills and see how, how well I can do as well. Um, so yeah, when I first bought this and in watching the, the videos and in reading the blogs, I kind of got a sense of some of the inventory I was going to need. So let's talk about inventory here real quick. Uh, because I think the most important part of any project is the planning stage. Uh, the planning stage is the foundation. Um, and if you don't perform your planning correctly, uh, I think you, you, all you're going to do is frustrate yourself in the end. So I'm going to quickly reach over here and grab my inventory that I began with. That figurine that I mentioned, this was what I had had, was what's in this basket here right now. These are some Humbrol enamel paints. There's a collection of them. Uh, the figurine was a character that had a small sword and uh, another big sword attached to their back. So I had the various colors that I was going to need to finish that. But I, I just, again, I, I found it a, a fairly frustrating process. I wasn't really into the final product. I was only working with brushes at the time. Uh, but, I, you know, I kept this up. I kept this all these years, and I, I dug it out the other day just to see what I, I had. I don't expect to use any of this except maybe the brushes. But you know what? These are so inexpensive that I'll probably replace them. These were enamels that I was brushing here, and uh, I don't know what kind of residue is still on them. So these are probably, I mean, I mean, I can use them for crap, but I mean, they're not stiff, but yeah, let's see. I could always get new brushes as well. Uh, so basically everything else you see here is inventory that I have had to collect in the past two weeks, and I don't even want to talk about expense. I'm not going to get into what things have costed, because quite frankly, I don't want to know. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a bit of a wallet breaker. I can admit that much. So for anyone who, like myself, um, either doesn't have a lot of experience in scale modeling or certainly not on a sophisticated level, um, this video may be informative because I am, uh, trying to approach this project in a very methodical way and uh, spending as much time planning up front uh, so that I don't have to encounter any unexpected difficulties. And, and you know, the internet is such a benefit. The internet, uh, spend some time looking around. That's what I've been doing, uh, making sure I understand uh, some of the difficulties and complications that other people have experienced and how they've resolved them. Um, more than anything else, it's not their, the resolutions that matter, but the creative process, the, the thinking through a problem and, and coming to a resolution to that problem. That's, that's something that uh, 
that I have to do in my career, and it's something that I can apply here as well. Spending that this past two weeks in the planning phase has been nothing but beneficial. It would have been so easy to actually get into the model and, and just start assembling it or painting it or cutting it up. But um, knowing what I wanted to achieve beforehand, at least it, to some degree, I think is going to benefit me by leaps and bounds in the long run. So as an example, and, and let's get into the first of my inventory here, uh, beyond the model itself, let me bring the model out here as well. Beyond the model itself, uh, because this is such a popular build, there are a lot of third-party accessories uh, and add-ons and components that are available. Uh, and you will want to consider these before you embark on the build itself uh, because the parts that, that you may buy in some cases are going to be integrated with the parts that you're assembling out of the kit. And an example of that, and I've ordered this, I, there are two, there are two um, third-party add-ons that I have ordered. One of them is the Paragraphics, um, what, are they, what are these called again? The Photo Etch set. Uh, and what this is, it's beautiful by the way. These are brass pieces that have been photo etched and you cut them out just like you would regular model parts out of the plastic tree. Uh, but these have such a fine level of detail. I mean, I'm nothing but impressed by this and I, I can't wait to start uh, working with it, which is gonna be pretty soon here. There's a few pieces that belong to the bridge assembly, which is what I'm working on now. Um, so I'm going to get into this here very quickly. His instructions are concise. They're pretty easy to understand. It's no different than, you know, in the model itself, understanding part numbers and uh, just spending the time reviewing the instructions before you embark on the build, Make, making sure you, you know what you're getting into and what to expect. Had I begun the bridge assembly and begun working on it and had it fully ready before this, this was ordered and or arrived, I would have discovered to my dismay that I would have either had to leave off some of the parts or modify the work I had done on the bridge assembly in order to accommodate uh, the extra pieces that belong on the bridge assembly. So I'm glad I waited. Uh, the other one that I have is from um, Orbital Dry Dock. It's coming through shortly, I, I hope, which is the masking for uh, the, the paint and, and the deckling, the painting, I should say. Uh, that hasn't arrived yet in Canada. We have a postal strike right now. It could be the case that it's just hung up in some uh, sorting plant, sorting warehouse or whatever. But they'll come eventually. I can't wait to get them. Fortunately, I, I'm not expecting to do any painting anytime soon. Uh, so it's not essential that they arrive yet. Probably not for... Well, certainly not for a couple of months I'm expecting to, to really take my time going through that. So I've broken this project down into three main build steps or, or build, yeah, build steps. One of them is the bottle itself. And uh, that's where I'm beginning. Uh, the second of these is the electrical system. And the third of them will be the base. The base I'm going to build myself. It's going to be custom. The reason I need the base to be custom, I'm not going to use the, the stock base because the the electrical system will need to be integrated with the base. And um, I'm also not, even though there are electrical systems out there that are pre-built, at least somewhat pre-built, uh, I am not going to use any of them because my career, my profession is in the IT industry. I am a 20 year veteran, I'm a programmer. Um, and what I've done for that is I've gone out and bought um, an Arduino. This is actually a Chinese knockoff of an Arduino. I didn't realize it at the time, but that's fine. It's, 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 a, it's a highly recommended one in the very least. So, I mean, as a programmer, yeah, this is something that I can really bring my skill set to bear and uh, really make something unique and fascinating and fun happen with the electrical component. Uh, one caveat, however, is that I am not an electrician. I know very little about circuitry. So something that I also bought was a Junior Genius Blinky Lights Basic Electronics Course Kit. And this came with some little basic components and an explanation of how 
you know, diodes work, how uh, resistors work, what they are, how capacitors work, what they are. And uh, it's just a, a little miniature course. It's very easy to understand. Um, of course, for the Arduino itself, there's also, there's so much, so many resources available on the internet that I don't expect to have too much trouble finding the references that I'm going to need to make that happen. You can see here, I'm already doing an experiment. Uh, what this does is it extends the number of I.O. ports for the Arduino, and apparently the, the chip that's involved here can be chained to give me an unlimited number of input and output ports. Now, we'll see. I'll experiment with that and see how it goes. Um, so yeah, I'm looking at doing a complete custom electronic assembly for this model. Uh, I'm really excited about that. It's a little bit intimidating. But I, you know, I've been taking some notes, and as I go to sleep at night, I'm getting some really interesting ideas, and some of them are a little overboard. So I, you know, I bring my expectations to bear, and uh, just make sure that I'm not uh, biting off more than I can chew there. But it should be a fun and uh, an interesting learning experience, anyway. So let's go through, let's go through some of the tools that I'm going to need through this build process. Oh, one more caveat is that I have never done any airbrushing before. So that is also going to be an interesting learning experience. Uh, when I first purchased this airbrush, he the, 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 we have a hobby store in the town that I live in, and he recommended this. He said it's not a strictly beginner brush. It's not strictly an advanced brush. It's somewhere in between. This is the Neo for Iowata. Iowata. Uh, he said this would be a, a good brush for me to use. He also recommended, because I didn't quite want to spend the budget on an air compressor at the time until I knew what I was getting into. What he recommended was this can of pressurized air. I'm just going to demonstrate something right now quickly. It didn't take long for me to realize that this was not going to be uh, a viable solution. And I'll show you why. Let's just plug this in real quick. First of all, the, the primary problem, and this became evident very quickly, is that I have no control of the air pressure coming from the can, except for the action of the airbrush itself. This is a what's called a dual action, anybody who's not familiar with airbrushing. Um, I'm still getting used to this. I have not put a single drop of paint into this thing yet. Uh, all I've been doing is getting the air pressure to come on. Let's see which way does this turn. That way, and is that right? Yeah. Okay, so once I open this thing up, what I discovered is that if I let the pressure build up a little bit, and then try to get a small amount of air out of it, I get huge pressure for a couple of seconds, and then it dies down. Let's let it go. Let's wait a couple of seconds. And I did. I just didn't. Oh, it seems to be consistent now. But believe me, it's not. It seems that um, for whatever reason, the pressure builds up in the hose, and uh, when you first start releasing the air. You get really high pressure and then it slowly dies down and then it normalizes. And that's just not sufficient for me. Um, even for practicing, I, I didn't want to hear it. Let's turn this off again. Okay. Even for practicing, I, if, I, I can't see that being very useful. So this, I don't know what I'll do with it. Maybe I'll, I mean, it would be useful just for the air itself, you know, cleaning dust and things like that. So I'll keep it around and I'll use it from time to time. The hose is nice. <laughs> <coughs> but uh, yeah, Neo for Iwata, that's what I'm going to be using. Uh, I've also been having, so beyond that, I had to consider using an air compressor. So I bought this, it was not expensive. I think I got this for a hundred bucks. It also came with, um, a little side cable. Well, it came with the hose. There's a hose here, this one, and this blue one. Again, I like the hose. Uh, it seems to be a different size. Uh, the the attachment end of it. This one is, I don't know if that's a one eighth, and this one is a one quarter or something like that. Or anyway, there these two hoses are not interchangeable, and I, I don't quite know why yet. I don't know if all com air compressors have this size of output. Um, something I'm going to find out. But this is not a very expensive air compressor. I only paid $100 for it. I'm undecided whether I'm going to keep it or not. Once again, the problem is that I cannot regulate the air pressure out of this. Uh, so this 
charges up to 60 PSI, I believe. And that's what I have to work with. The moment that I press the, uh, the action on the airbrush, uh, it uses a few seconds of air pressure, and then this thing kicks in. It, there, there's, there's no waiting period. There's no way to bring this down. So if I wanted to bring this down to a 12, 12 PSI output through the hose, I can't do that. I can probably go to my local little hardware store and find a, an attachment for this. I can maybe even buy a little, like a, a little air storage tank, maybe charge that up, run the air pressure regulator off of that. I'm not sure. What I'm probably going to end up doing is bringing this back to the store and uh, biting the bullet and spending the extra budget on, a, on a, the air compressor that I'm going to be happy with and that's going to be useful for me in this build process. Uh, something else that I've had to consider was cleaning and a cleaning solution. Cleaning is entirely dependent on the kind of paint that you're going to use. Uh, in the past modeling that I've done with brushes, uh, the paint that I've used is enamel. It's extremely painful to clean and it's messy and smelly. It's something that I've never particularly enjoyed about the modeling, even though I do enjoy, you know, exercising my creative ability and whatever else. I, I, I've never been happy with the odors <laughs> that it produces. Ah, there's no way to escape it, but I think there is a way to minimize it. So what I've done is I've gone with acrylic paints. We'll get into paints in a, in a moment here in the cleaning requirements for acrylics. Um, through all the recommendations that I saw online, this little thing is very handy uh, for keeping your airbrushes clean, for keeping them parked. Uh, so I went out and spent the money on that. Um, now paints. Now, something that I, 25 years ago, as I mentioned, 20 years ago, when I, I, I was doing some modeling, uh, Acrylics, I don't remember them even really being an option. Maybe it was just the uh, hobby store that I went to, but it seemed to me that er all the options were enamel. I didn't even know the difference at the time between enamel and uh, the acrylics, but um, all the paints that I've had to date have been enamel. What I've done this time, and I've, I've done some research, and I understand that the technology that goes into the acrylic paints is far superior than what it was 25 years ago. So the quality of a paint job that you're going to get out on acrylic these days is extremely high. Uh, and the, the odors are going to be a lot less. The cleaning is a lot easier. So in the end, I've decided to go with acrylic paints. We'll get into the colors here that I've chosen in a moment. So as far as cleaning, again, I've done my homework, a little bit of research and investigation. And uh, I originally bought this bottle of mineral spirits because as, as I mentioned before, my expectation was that it, if I have model paints, I'm going to need mineral spirits. And I may still need this. Um, but for now, I think the solutions that I've chosen, I'm not going to need the mineral spirits. Uh, what I am going to need is some distilled water because the water that I have here in my hometown is uh, very hard. There's a lot of minerals in it. And I'm also going to need, oops, I almost knocked something over. I don't even know what that was. This is windshield wiper fluid. Oh, plain windshield wiper fluid. The key, the key component of this is that it does not have any ammonia, which apparently is not healthy for your airbrush. So I went and uh, bought this. This was like two bucks or something at uh, my local automobile store. And this apparently works very well for cleaning your airbrush and uh, working with acrylic paint. And I have one more thing over here. Oh, my cord is pulling. And finally, I have lacquer thinner. I don't, I don't know if this is going to be involved in the paint cleaning process, but I, I did go out and buy some of this. Uh, when I realized I was going to be using enamel or sorry, acrylic paints, I thought, well, maybe that was a waste of a few bucks, but apparently it's not going to be. And we'll get into why here in a moment. So let's leave that out. Uh, the distilled water, this can apparently be used for thinning my paints, certainly for cleaning the airbrush um between colors and whatnot so 
I mean, that's not expensive. I My local Safeway has this in stock, so I can buy that there. Uh, I'm not, still not entirely certain about the windshield wiper fluid, but apparently it does work. It's a good solution. It's not harmful to any of the surfaces or the tools I'll be working with. So uh, yeah, we'll see. I'll check that out and we'll get back on that through the build process. Now for paints, I have bought, let's talk about first and second and third and whatever stage painting we're going to be doing here. Um, spent a little time researching again, like I said, and making some decisions on this. What we have here is uh, an adhesion promoter made by Duplicolor. Um, I have my surface primer by Tamiya. This is a lacquer primer, I believe. And I have some color. This is my base coat for the model itself. The color that I've chosen, uh, now on the instructions for the model, it says the, the base color is flat white. And when I went into my local hobby store, I saw that he did have flat white. Uh, and I had that in my hand, but I continued looking around a little bit. And I came across this one and what attracted my attention is this is insignia white uh, for the US Navy. This is uh, apparently a replication of the color that uh, the US Navy uses for their aircraft, or I don't know, maybe their ships as well, but certainly their aircraft. And I thought, you know, we've got the USS Enterprise. Um, this is the paint that I want. So this is what I am going to be using. I hope I get good results out of this um, because I'm pretty committed to using this uh, Tamiya. I haven't opened any of these cans. I haven't used any of it yet, well, but uh, I will. And I'll certainly report the results I get from this. I have used some of the primer um, during the, the work I've done on the bridge assembly. Uh, this is not something because it is lacquer based, I believe. This is not something that I would do here in my kitchen. Uh, I might have a, a little paint booth that I've set up in my garage downstairs, and that's where I, I do my painting with these smelly cans. Now, let's talk about the adhesion promoter for a moment. I saw this recommended. Uh, I believe it was in the Trekworks channel, which I, if I haven't mentioned, did I ever mention that yet? There's a channel on YouTube uh, called Trekworks, and he goes through a very uh, detailed... I think it was a 24 video build process, his experience with this exact same model. It's a model that he had already worked with numerous times. He is a professional modeler, nothing but respect for uh, what he does. So when he makes a recommendation, I take it seriously. And, and this is one of the things he did recommend. So I did go through the first few of his videos, you know, the, the first time around, and I started collecting inventory. And uh, I walked into my local hobby store and I asked him if he carried such a thing as adhesion promoter. And without even answering that question, he said, ah, oh, you don't need that. He says, just, to, just get yourself a good primer. He says, you have a good primer. You're not going to need adhesion promoter. He may be right, but from what I understand, uh, the reason you may need this is because when you, here, let me get my, um, I have the part out right now. When you're working, as I mentioned, I have I have ordered the uh, Orbital Dry Dock masking kit. And what that does is it gives me the, the masking to achieve the Aztec patterns uh, on all the surfaces of the exterior of the ship. And what that involves is a lot of masking, pulling up, masking, pulling up, masking, pulling up. Like I, there's four different colors besides the base. So there's a lot of masking and pulling up um, and that's where the adhesion promoter comes in. This is a step that will help to ensure that during that pulling up of the masking that I'm not going to stress the paint uh, underneath those masks. If I wasn't doing the masking process, my hobby store fellow was probably correct. I probably wouldn't need this, but because I'm, I'm doing a lot of, you know, just a little bit, it's the same concept as a, a blade of grass pushing through concrete. Just constant, little bit of pressure, but if it's constant enough, it can cause some damage. So, and, and personally, I would rather use it and not have needed it than not used it and realize that I needed it. So I went ahead, this was not expensive, it was under 10 bucks. I went ahead and bought it. And uh, yeah, 
I will be using that. I, I'll take uh, Trekworks' recommendation on that matter because he has worked with this bottle before. He does it for a living. He knows what he's talking about. So let's move on while we're talking about paints and colors. This was something that I had to spend a lot of time thinking about. There is, actually let me pull out the model again here. There is color, a color chart included with the instructions in this kit. Let's quickly review some of them. Unfortunately, they're all almost all Model Master colors. And as far as I know, Model Master doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there are a few colors that were testers. So that for me, that just wasn't, it, it was hard to decide what, what colors I was going to need to purchase because I couldn't just go ahead and buy the Model Master colors. And besides all of that, if you were to look on the back of the box, let me pull these instructions out. Let me pull the de decals out so we can have a look at those as well. Um, there, there is some photography on the back of the box. And after spending some time looking at other people's build processes, uh, I'm not particularly satisfied with the, the results there. I don't know if they're accurate to the original studio model. Um, Besides all of that, there's a lot of these decals that I won't be using. Uh, I would rather use paint if I can, rather than decaling, because decals give you that that edge. Like for example, I've seen close-up shots, people who have used the NCC 1701, the designation, and uh, you can see, if, if you look at it closely enough, you can see the edge of the deckling, and that's just not satisfactory to me at all. So uh, one of the things I'm happy, to, happy with is that orbital, orbital dry dock. His masking set includes a lot of the masks to apparently achieve uh, this, which is called the strong back coloring and uh, the main designation here. And that makes me pretty happy because those are areas that people are gonna look closely at. Um, so I am not gonna go off the coloring based on this. I don't even know if this is accurate or not. This is apparently the colors for the, like the NCC 1701 but there is also the option to convert this to the 1701A, and I don't want to do that. I'm a huge fan of the uh, Rathacon and Search for Spock. Those are the two, in my opinion, those are the two best sci-fi back-to-back movies uh, in existence. I love watching them over and over again, even before, long before I decided to do this. As a teenager, I used to love those movies, so. Uh, yeah, so matching the paint colors was something that uh, was a bit of a chore. I spent a lot of time, I, I did decide on the Vallejo, the model errors, um, simply because there's such a huge selection of colors. Uh, and I, as I said, I'm not experienced with airbrushing. I'm not very experienced with paint mixing. So I didn't want to rely on my expertise in that area. So if I can buy a bottle of paint that's useful out of the bottle, I will do that. Um, rather than having to do too much mixing myself. Uh, so yeah, matching these Model Master colors was just simply not an option. I spent some time on Google. Once I had decided on going with Vallejo, I spent time on Google um, and even Amazon. They had, you know, nice pictures of, of the bottles of these Vallejo colors, and I was able to kind of get an idea of what was out there. There are some apps available. There is at least one app available that's supposed to help in... Uh, matching colors between brands. I didn't find it helpful at all. Some of the colors were just simply non-existent. Between your screen on your laptop or your computer or your cell phone, uh, the colors that you see there are not going to be the colors always. You, you can't rely on those being the colors that you're gonna achieve. So what I decided is that I physically had to go into the store, pick up the bottles, have a good look. And uh, even once I had had a few, I opened them up and just dropped drops on a, on a piece of paper just to see what the actual color was. And in some cases, I wasn't very happy with them. So um, I just spent a little more time going through it. And, you know, just one by one, I picked up the colors that I wanted. And what I ended up with, so we've talked about my base color being the Insignia White. Beyond that, to replicate the color scheme of the studio model for the refit enterprise there's a, uh, 
there's a shade of blue and a shade of green that you're going to need. In the end, what I've decided is to go with the duck egg green and the pale blue for Vallejo. And I'll bring this closer to the camera here. And hopefully we can... No, the camera doesn't really do it much justice. Where are we? So those, that's the green and the blue that I've decided to use. Uh, I am going to need shades of this. So in the end, it's probably going to involve some mixing anyway, uh, unless I can go in and again, compare bottles and just see if I can find something that would work well as a lighter shade and maybe a darker shade of this. This is gonna be the base uh, for the green that I use. This is gonna be the base for the blue that I use. So having a lighter and a darker for both of these would be nice. Uh, the third consideration is gonna be your grays. Uh, there is some, some grays on the ship. Um, and in this, you know, grays are, are so widely used in modeling. Uh, I found a very good selection. What I've gone with here, I've picked out four different colors of gray. I've got my pale blue gray, which is the lightest. I've got the light gray, which is a little bit darker. I've got the neutral gray, which is starting to get into the far more dark. Uh, and it is a shade darker than the light gray, which is nice, but also the sea gray. I may not use all four of these, but I'll certainly probably have to pick a combination of three of them. And I have held these up with uh, the blue and the green that I've selected. The colors do seem to look nice together. I particularly like the pale blue. It looks really nice. Or sorry, yeah, the pale blue gray looks really nice with the pale blue. Uh, the sea gray, or what did I, f I was looking at these earlier and I decided I really liked a combination. Oh yeah, the light gray, along with that duck egg green, looks really nice as well. I think these colors are gonna work well together, so I'm pleased with that selection so far. I've got my blue, I've got my green, I've got my grays. Beyond that, there are little, there are other colors that I'm going to need minute amounts of as I go through this build. I'll just grab these real quick and show you what they are. So you have a blue. Uh, I think the only place this is needed is in the Arboretum uh, for the water. Although in space, I, I don't see water being blue unless they've colored the bottom of their pond just to give it that 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 blue shade. But water is clear. We all know that. We get blue from the sky and in space there's no sky so eh, i'm not sure how i'm going to do that yet i bought a medium yellow this is used for marking the area around the thrusters of the ship so again small amounts of this are going to be used um a dark yellow i don't know if i'm going to need that or not i bought it just in case it looks like mustard looks like one of those fancy mustards uh originally i had before i picked out all of my grays i had come up with a camouflage gray but it's very beige. I don't see myself using this except maybe again in the Arboretum. Uh, if it is kind of a brownish or a beigeish color, then maybe I can use that um, in the Arboretum. There is the sand color, which I, I did pick out for the Arboretum, but it looks very pinkish. It's got an orange or a pink hue to it, which maybe between these two, uh, I can achieve some realism there, we'll see. Uh, there is a rust color, which is called for, in the instructions anyway, it's called for on the bridge assembly and also on the shuttlecraft. I don't see myself using it for either. In all of the uh, videos that I've seen other people working, I, I don't recall seeing them using a rust color, so I don't, I don't expect to actually use that. Um, and of course, copper, and this is used in the, the engine nacelles. So certainly that will be used. Uh, I don't think I have all the colors. I may need to buy a, a couple, few more bottles. I'm not sure. Uh, we'll find out when I get there. I'm really pleased with the, uh, the blue and the green that I've chosen though. I think those are going to work well. So let's move on to, we talk about our coloring. I'd like to move on to the adhesives. And I just have a few basic adhesives. I've got my gold testers in a tube. Uh, that's not an adhesive. I've got the uh, CA medium. 
which is a very quick dry. This is basically super glue, a medium thickness super glue. Uh, to complement that, I bought the kicker, the accelerator, uh, which comes with a nice little spritzer top. Um, and I also bought the precision poly cement, which I haven't used yet. I don't know if I'm going to, but I bought it just to have it in my at my disposal if I needed it. Uh, this is just a regular old hobby thinner. I don't know the I don't know what variety of this it is. I've had this for a long time. The original label didn't indicate. It may have. I don't remember if it had the active ingredients in it or not. All I remember about the, about the label is that it really stunk. As I was using the thinner in this, I bought this originally for the figurine that I mentioned. Um, I was working with enamel paints at the time. I used this to clean my brushes. Uh, so this is effective as an enamel thinner. I have used small amounts of this just to clean the surface of the, the bridge assembly while I was working on this. The reason I peeled the label off is it was a, it was a paper label. And as I was using this, I was pouring small amounts into other bottles or even just dipping it into a cloth, uh, I would get amounts of thinner dripping into the label and the label stunk. And the only way to to eliminate that odor was to actually peel the label off of it. So, well, I, uh, I added a label, but... So, yeah, adhesives. I include tape as adhesives. So I've got some Tamiya masking tape, which is apparently a very good solution for fine masking. So I went ahead and spent the money on that, um, but it's very expensive. I'm gonna try to limit my use of it unless it's necessary. Uh, so I've got my trusty blue as well and I expect to use this often. Um, so now beyond, well, I also have my, uh, where is it? I've got some scotch tape. I've got some electrical tape. My house is full of tape. I know I have a, <laughs> I have a selection of tapes. I'm not concerned about that. Uh, something else that I purchased, this is for filling in gaps. I'm probably going to entertain the idea of needing another form of putty, but this is a squadron white putty. I have used some of it. So this is an odor. You want to be ventilated when you're using this stuff. Um, I found it very thick. So in fact, just the other day, I was uh, researching how to thin it out for filling small cracks. And I realized it, or I've learned, I should say that it can be done. And that's where the lacquer thinner comes in. Uh, this is very smelly, so I do have a mask somewhere around here, a paint mask with a, or an interchangeable filter on it. But yeah, that's where the lacquer thinner is definitely going to come in handy. Okay, so what, we've gone through our colors, we've gone through our adhesives. Abrasives. Abrasives is also very important. This is something that I've had to build up a little collection of. I have previously done some work on my car. So I did have some abrasives already. I had 1000 grit. I had the 600 grit. And I also had it around here somewhere, some like 250 grit, I think it was. No, 80 grit. This is really rough stuff. And 220 I have as well. So I've got a collection of abrasives that are necessary. Um, as far as now, this has been my favorite so far. I found this hanging on the shelf of my local hobby shop. I didn't know if this was going to come in useful or not. I just bought them on a whim. They weren't very expensive. And I got to say, these have been incredibly handy. Just in a little bit of work that I've done so far, uh, alpha abrasives. I imagine you can get these little sticks all over the place. But these are very thin. And there are five different grits. Let's see, what are they? Let's sit on the packaging here. We have a... Uh, 100 grit, 180 grit, 240 grit, 320 grit, and the 400 grit. And I have really enjoyed working with these. Uh, I wish I had 10 packs of this. Uh, unfortunately, I bought the last one. I'm not sure if he's gonna restock this or not. I'm gonna encourage him to do so because I've seen myself buying a lot of these. I've really liked working with this, particularly on rounded surfaces because they bend nicely. There is a little bit of a resistance on them, but they do bend and uh, so for sanding down rounded surfaces. I found these very handy. Um, 
the braces, is that everything? Oh, one thing I don't have are files. And I'm going to need them very soon. In fact, I may go down to my little uh, hand, handy store, hardware store, and pick up some files. What I, I have had to use so far is my little nail clipper file. And it works, but um, I realized very quickly that a, an assortment of little small files is, is essential. Now, as far as let's see, is that it for my abrasives? Yeah, oh, something I've found mentioned as well is that shop cloth works as an abrasive. And I've tried it, it's true on a layer of primer. I was just able to use a little bit of pressure and uh, just rough up, or sorry, um, remove the rough the rough edges of the primer. And I found shop towel work really well as, a, as an abrasive as well as a, a cleaning rag. So what else do we have? Oh yeah, right in front of me. Speaking of working with smelly substances and chemical substances, I found that uh, I have these latex gloves and I have used them already. So for example, working with that squadron putty, I don't let that get onto my skin. I have applied a little bit. I put the glove on, apply a little to my finger, and I've worked that on as well. I'm curious to see how well uh, it's. this is going to work when I start um, thinning down that putty. Uh, maybe the case that it will work well, but it doesn't achieve a, a really nice edge like like a spatula would or um, I don't know what that tool would be, something that, that has a nice flat, semi-flexible surface. If I'm trying to fill a tiny little seam, I don't think the gloves and the finger is a very good solution. What I have tried to do is use a little piece of styrene strip as a spatula just to try to get some putty into a seam. And the results weren't great. That may simply be because the uh, the putty was too thick. So we'll see. I'll thin it down and try that again. But uh, certainly a, a little filling tool of some kind is uh, on my list. Speaking of styrene strip, if you're going to do any modifications, which I recommend you do, particularly if you're going to be lighting your enterprise, uh, I've <laughs> these basically I've, I've ended up buying one at a time and I've used at least one out of each of these packages so far and I, I'm, I'm needing more of them already so uh, yeah styrene strip be prepared I found that uh, a, my hobby store has a good selection of these and I found that that's that's essential okay so that's abrasives oh one more thing for abrasives and this is more maybe in the tools inventory but uh, a dremel is very handy to have and I've used this to grind off unwanted areas of uh, of the model, which we'll get into when I start doing the actual build. But yeah, a Dremel is very handy to have. Probably also a drill, although I haven't had to use one yet. A drill is going to be handy as well. I've got a big pair of scissors. I've got a medium pair of scissors. I've got a small pair of scissors. I don't know that all three of these are essential, but I bought them anyway. But what you will need what um, is a good uh, X-Acto knife and some blades for it. So I, I haven't had to change the blade yet. And I'm about 40 hours in on the bridge assembly. But uh, yeah, this has been essential. This is almost, I, I could almost tape this to my hand. I use it so often. Uh, also a measuring tool. I have found this incredibly handy. Uh, this is a precision me measuring tool in centimeters, in metric. Um, and I've really, I'm really happy that I have this. This is already in my toolbox. I pulled it out day one and it's been used constantly since then. Uh, yeah. What else do we have here? I think I've gone through almost everything. These are parts of my Dremel tool. I did also have in my existing tool set, uh, precision driver and bit set. I haven't really had to use it yet, but, um, as a set of tweezers, which are going to come in handy. I don't see myself needing any of the bits or the driver, but it does also have a little magnifying glass, which I have pulled out a couple of times. It became frustrating to open that kit to do that. So what I have also had here handy is this little set of helping hands. And I've used the magnifying lens here a couple of times, not very often, but a couple of times it has come in handy. Um, more than anything, this is going to be used when I get into the electrical portion of the build. 
so that was a helpful tool. Speaking of the electrical portion, soldering iron. Uh, does this have a variable temperature? It does. I debated whether or not to spend the money, but in the end, my hardware store had this on sale. It had variable temperature. It had a little docking station with a sponge. Uh, it came with a fine point tip. Um, I may or may not need to buy the one with the flat edge, the, or sorry, a flat edge replacement. We'll see. And of course, solder. When I get into electrical, the solder is going to be essential. I don't see myself needing that anytime soon, but I, I am going to need it, obviously. Okay, so I had the decals out and I never did get to why I took them out. Um, <laughs> I had thought I was gonna bring these into the, the hobby shop and uh, try to match my colors with this. I never did in the end, but I probably could have. I think I'm doing all right though. I've got a blue that looks good. See, this, this blue is very dark compared to most of the shading that I see on the decals. The green it doesn't really match any of these shades. Well, it's relatively close, but that, again, this is a duck egg, which the uh, color kit called for. So I am happy with it. That is the green and blue that I'm going to use. I'm pretty committed to that now. And one last item that I'm going to bring out, and that is the USS Enterprise D. This, this ship gets a lot of flack, and I think unfairly so. Um, I don't mind it. It's certainly not my favorite Enterprise, but uh, I don't mind it. I like it. The reason I have this, I walked into my uh, hobby store, and I was talking to the fellow there, and I asked him what kind of a kit he would recommend for airbrushing practice. As I mentioned, I've never airbrushed before. I am trying to get the feel of an airbrush. Sometimes I'll sit in front of my television at night and I'll just hold this in my hand and just try to get used to the action. Just fidget with it for a while. I don't think it does any harm to just lightly and gently play around with that. I'm just trying to get the feel for this. So I'll sit in front of my TV and just play around with that. Um, but I, again, I still, I'm not going to do any actual airbrush painting on the model until I have uh, some confidence that I'm, that I understand what I'm doing with it, that I have some, some that I have some level of expectation as to what I can accomplish with this. I don't want to ruin the model while I'm working on it. So my goal was to get another model uh, that I could practice with. So I walk into the store and I ask the fellow if he had something that he would recommend. And he says, you know what? I have exactly what you need. Um, he ran into the back of the store, he came back out. He showed this to me. He says, I will sell this to you for, for 20 bucks. I hummed and hawed. I was like, yeah, you know what? I'm not sure. It wasn't what I was anticipating. I was expecting to spend maybe 10 to 12, 15 bucks, maybe on a, on a model car or something. And he saw me humming and hawing. He says, okay, I'll give it to you for 15 bucks. And I said, well, for 15 bucks, I can't go wrong. So I get to practice with my color scheme on at least a version of the Enterprise. And uh, yeah, that's this is from my airbrush practice. So I'm pretty pleased, 15 bucks. And it's a lighted kit as well. So I also get some experience with uh, bulbs and wiring inside this kit and with fiber optics. So that's kind of handy dandy. And for $15, I said, you know what? That is sold for cash. Anyway, I think that does it for my introduction video. And uh, all I can say now is Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I am committed to this project. It may take some time, but I will get to the end. And uh, for those of you who are interested in following along, you're certainly welcome to do so. Anybody who has any advice or even constructive criticism, you're more than welcome to pass that along. Thank you very much.